So, hi everybody. Thanks for, host, for having me. I am very excited about .go. I hope you are as well. And I'm here because optimizing is fun and because I think it's a great opportunity to use this beautiful picture. But wait, the first question you should be asking is, is your program actually slow? By which we mean, do you think it could go faster? But most importantly, do you think is it, it is worth optimizing and spending the time and energy to do that? Enter a silly example. We have a function that copies a list of strings, that's straightforward, and we benchmark it, including allocations. And we see that copying about 100 elements takes five microseconds and 10 allocations. We get that benchmark data. And with pprov, we can see that most of the time is spent on the append line, which makes sense. So we optimize it, we pre-allocate that slice, and then we just assign each of the elements. And as expected, it's 70% faster, it only allocates once, so that's it, we're done. Thanks for listening. No? But hang on, this is a silly example. Enter a JSON benchmark. JSON, uh, just, this JSON benchmark, it, has, it is a decoder benchmark, and it runs about 100 times per second. It takes about 10 milliseconds, and it allocates a lot. So this benchmark is slow. But most importantly, it is not going to stand still. So if we run it a few times in a row with a tool called BenchComp, we're going to see that every time it jumps up and down a little bit. And this is a problem, because recent JSON speedups have been as small as 1.3%. As so how can we possibly measure progress with this much noise? The solution is math, or in particular, statistics. You need to get multiple samples and then measure variance with that. So instead of BenchComp, we're going to use a tool called BenchStat, which is basically a better tool, a better version of that. And we're going to collect multiple samples with uh, dash count, that flag. And with BenchStat, it's going to give us a time per operation, but it's also going to give us a variance. So in this case, it jumps up and down by roughly 3%. But we still need less noise, because as we showed, the recent JSON speedups have been as small as 1%. The first question we should ask is, is our machine actually idle? Now, I shouldn't use my work friends. When I work on Go code, I tend to have two different browsers open, each one of them with a different Slack account, a couple of editors, my email, and so on. And this takes about between 0 and 15% of my CPU on average. But this JSON benchmark depends 100% of all of my CPUs, because it is JSON after all. So the first bit of fun that I found out with this is that the Gopher Slack has an emoji called Badger, and it's like a dancing badger. It's really fun. But the animation on Slack, because it's an Electron app, it takes about 2% of my CPU. So a friend, of mine, a friend of mine, Paul Jolly, used to send me 50 badgers on a single message as a joke, and that would just throttle my CPU. So that, that wasn't fun. So close resource-hungry apps, and that goes especially for apps like Slack. So now my CPU usage on my laptop sits up between 0 and 4%. So if we rerun um, eight iterations of this benchmark, we see that variance is down to 1%. And we can work with 1% variance. However, the CPU burns. If we run the benchmark 20 times, we can see that after 10 or so, it gets much slower. Now, why is that? The reason is the laptops throttle, especially modern ones. And I have some evidence to back that up. This is my current laptop with my trusty gopher on top. And you can see that the air vents are so tiny that they're smaller than the gopher itself. And this laptop has four real cores and has, can go up to fairly decent turbo speeds. But the air vents measure roughly two gopher feet, which is a real unit of measurement, OK? So in practice, this is how I used to benchmark Go code, just having my lap on fire and going like, this is fine. It's just going to be fine. So the laptop sustains the turbo speed at 100% uh, usage for about eight seconds and then throttles down to about 2.7 gigahertz. So we cannot use turbo speeds, because the ventilation of the laptop doesn't keep up. The solution to this is more tooling. There's this tool that Austin Clemens, one of the Go team members, wrote called Perflock, and it does what you kind of would expect from the name. You run it as a daemon, and then it lets you run a program, in this case a benchmark, at a, at a, at a uh, fixed um, CPU clock speed. In this case, 70% is fast enough so that I get realistic benchmark numbers, but slow enough that my laptop doesn't throttle. So after 20 runs, you can see that I'm still getting the same results. Um, a small caveat, this only works for Linux, but this tool isn't that complicated. I presume it could be ported to Mac and Windows, so if anybody wants to do that, I'm sure Austin could welcome pull requests. So if we run the same benchmark eight times before and after without actually changing the code at all, 
we can see that even though the time's preparation changed slightly, because the variance is so high, it's 1%, bench that is smart enough with statistics and math magic, it's able to tell us that most likely nothing has actually changed and nothing has improved, which is correct. But we've skimmed past some of the finer details, such as what count value should you use, or what is a p-value. Now, I only took one class in statistics at university, so I'm not going to try to explain what a p-value is, but I'm going to try to explain how I understand all this to work. And the rough idea is that if your benchmark has a high variance, you should use a larger n, a larger count value. And I've got a small visual aid, which, which I think is quite easy to understand. Suppose that you've got three gopher data points, and they're just sitting there. And the y-axis is how fast your benchmark is. So in this case, if it's higher, the longer time the benchmark took. So with just three data points, they jump around too much. It's hard to tell if your benchmark actually got faster or not. You just wouldn't say that with confidence. But if you've got 10 data points, it is easier to see that there's a trend going downwards. So you would probably get a lower p-value, and you would be able to say with some confidence that something has probably improved here. But there's a gotcha. Don't search for p-values. And this is actually called the multiple testing problem. And I also have a simple example to show that. We saw before that if you run a single iteration of a benchmark multiple times, the time is going to jump up and down, because this is a modern CPU running Linux and Slack and a bunch of other things. So you don't get a dedicated CPU, and JSON does a bunch of things with a GC. So it's not static. So it is going to jump up and down. Now, if you use Benchstat, like we saw, you're far less likely to see those numbers jump, jump up and down. But because this is statistics, about 5% of the time, if you're lucky, or rather unlucky enough, you are going to get a significant result, even though you haven't touched the code at all. In this case, I hadn't touched the code at all. And after 12 or so runs, I got, oh, a 1% improvement. So if you just keep running the benchmark and just pick that one, you can go like, oh, I sped up the JSON decoder without actually touching it. Magic. In practice, no. It's because you were just searching for the data that you liked. So if the data looks bad, don't get new data. Because if you do that, eventually, you are going to be, you're going to find what you're looking for, which is probably not going to be good. And there's obviously an XKCD about this. Uh, they try to find, some scientists try to find the link between different calls of jelly beans and acne. And they run so many tests that one of them actually um, is a positive. And then the, the newspapers publish it. Green, belly, green jelly beans linked to acne, only 5% chance of coincidence. But because they ran so many tests, it is actually a coincidence. And if they run the test again, it's going to be false. But it's already published. So don't do the same when optimizing code. A small side note is bottlenecks. Much of what I'm talking about is for CPU-bound loads, such as pprof and perflock. But statistics, and in our case, benchstat, work for all benchmarks, even if your benchmark is measuring network latency or disk I.O. So to recap, use benchstat to compare statistics about your benchmarks and perflock to avoid noise in those numbers. Now we get to the fun part, or at least what I think is the fun part, which is some compiler tricks to help you get good numbers. The first one, some of you might know about it. You can ask the compiler for information on its optimizing decisions. And if you use two M flies, that's, that enables more information. So for example, you can ask it which functions were too complex to inline. So you can maybe simplify them a little bit so that they're inlined. You can also ask it which expressions escape to the heap, which means which expressions cause allocations. In this case, there's a conversion from a string to a, a byte slice, which does cause an allocation in the IO package. And you can also ask it information about specific features of the compiler. In this case, BCE stands for bound check elimination, which means a, a runtime check that when you access a slice, for example, the index is within bounds. So debug, the, the debug value one tells you when it is inserting these bounce checks. So if you do find a bounce check in a hot function, you probably want to get rid of that somehow, or at least try to. Another compiler feature with, which is kind of related is the proof pass. And the proof pass tries to prove things. One of the things it does is it tries to prove when bounce checks are not necessary. So for example, if it knows that, that some i is between 0 and 10, and it knows that your slice is big enough, then it doesn't need the bounce check. So in this case, it does remove some bounce checks from the IO package. And you can enable a higher debug level, and then it's going to give you internal information, which is probably not very useful to you, but it might be if you're digging into why some program is not being optimized properly. There's a gotcha that I want to cover, which is when you change your code in some way, 
and then some benchmark gets suddenly slower or faster, and you cannot explain why. And here's an example. Ross Cox um, wrote this commit in, back in 2011. He, he improved part of the um, JSON decoder, and some benchmarks did get faster, but this one got faster and it shouldn't have. So the commit reads, maybe it is one of those code alignment, code alignment things. And the reason behind this is that modern computers are complicated. And for example, if you change code, it might shuffle the actual, the actual code within the binary. And because computers are complicated, it might actually make the, com the code run faster or slower because of caches, for example. I'm not a hardware engineer, so I'm just, I'm just speaking for speaking. But um, if this happens to you and you cannot explain why, you can just copy what Ross wrote. Now, the compiler is getting better. For example, back in the days, the best way to empty a map was just to just create a new map and allocate a new map. Nowadays, since Go 111, you can just clear the uh, keys in the map, and that's going to compile. The, the compiler is going to see that for loop, and it's going to compile it into a single statement, which is going to efficiently clear all the map without ranging over it, which is as fast as creating a new one, but without allocating new space. And something similar happened with counting the number of runes inside of string. It used to be that the only way to do this natively with Go, without the standard library, was to just iterate over, this, over the string, because that gives you each of the runes. But since Go 111, if you take the length of the rune slice of the string, it doesn't do a copy, and it gives you the same result. And it's simpler to read, I think. So please give the compiler a chance. And if you, th if you think it could do better, and you can reason about it, please file a bug so that it can improve. On the Go issue tracker, we use the label called performance for this kind of thing. So if you want to search for duplicates or if you want to file a bug, please use it so that we can find it. And if you want to go deeper, there's this really cool feature called Go SSA Funk, and you give it a pattern, and then the compiler gives you information about how it's compiling that specific function. So in this case, we have a very dummy um, hello world function that just prints something, and we do Go SSA Funk equals that function Go build. And it gives us an HTML file. Now, the HTML file is huge, and so I can't show the whole thing here. But I'm going to show the first step of that HTML file. It's, how, it's what the compiler starts with. This is the initial SSA representation of the compiler. And then it gives you the end, that is the assembly that it generates for your architecture. And in between all the stages that it goes through, including bounce check elimination, so if you see that your assembly is not as optimized as it could be, you can see all the steps, and you can try to figure out where it went wrong. If you want to read more into how the compiler works, there's a couple of readmes that you could read. They do link to extra documentation and extra information, and obviously I'm not going to cover all that here. And some of what I covered here about Benchstat, I think it's very useful, even if you don't work on, the, on Go itself, because Benchstat is useful for any benchmark. So there's an open issue about adding a, some quick start documentation for that package. So if you want to subscribe to that issue, feel free, or feel free, to, feel free to contribute. So to wrap up, I hope you find Go performance tuning as fun as I do. Um, that gopher definitely finds it amusing. That's a piece of bacon, I believe. And when you do optimize, please use the right tools and be responsible. Thank you.